Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the William S. Paley Festival. My name is Ron Simon, and Rodelmania lives. What? As you all know, this is a great period for the Ruddles. They've just released their number one hits. It's the number one sensation around the world, and we're lucky to have them here. In fact, on this stage is the first appearance of Dirk, Ron, and Stig together for the first time since they agreed to stop suing each other. So, uh, but, uh, and we'll also be screening the complete All You Need Is Cash, the program that grew out of this uh, little sketch uh, that was first seen on Saturday Night Live. And we're showing a print that's been remastered from the original tape, and we're really appreciative to Rhino for providing this. And, and we're really happy to screen uh, the Ruddles television special. As you see it, it really began a whole new uh, genre in television. It was the mockumentary. And uh, just a few days ago, we showed White Poopy Little America, which continued that trend. But as you look at the Ruddles now, you, it looks just like all the behind the music specials, the rise and fall of rock groups. So it's 20 years uh, we're seeing television now that is uh, very much part of the American scene. Um, it's also a very brilliant parody, and we're really glad to have the two people that really created and conceived uh, the Ruddles, uh, Eric Idle and Neil Innes, here to talk about it. And we'll talk about it since their first association early in British television in the 60s, and we'll talk about how it came to be. So we're really looking forward to it. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, who uh, will participate in the discussion after the screening of All You Need Is Cash. First, the co-director of The Ruddles, Gary Weiss learned to make films from the legendary Sam Peckinpah. He made a documentary about the making of Peckinpah's The Ballad of Cable Hogue and went on to direct a portrait of Jimi Hendrix and several Lily Tomlin specials. Gary also created many short films for Saturday Night Live and received a Director's Guild Award for a Steve Martin special. He has made music videos for Paul Simon, George Harrison, and the Bangles, as well as directing many, many commercials. Please welcome Gary Weiss. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Stig lives, and he lives in the person of Ricky Fatar. Ricky is an well accomplished guitarist and also drummer, and uh, he is a respected session man, worked with many, many artists from Bog Skaggs to Bonnie Raitt. He was also a member of the Beach Boys in the early 70s, drumming with Dennis Wilson. So a Ruddle who was also a Beach Boy. Please welcome Stig O'Hare, Ricky Fatar. Neil Innes is the writer and producer of all the Ruddles music. He began his career with the legendary Bonzo D Dog Doodah Band, a group that is celebrated in England. There are film retrospectives of their work, and hopefully we'll be able to do something here in the States as well. Later, Neil joined forces with Monty Python on albums, films, and concert tours. Neil recently has been performing live with his one-man one show, Innes own worlds and plan in his own words rather and plans to re release a CD of his new songs. Please welcome Ron Nasty, Neil Innes. And Eric Idle is the writer, co-director, and host of The Ruddles. And if you want to know what British royalty is in popular culture, you just have to know the Kings or the Four Beatles. And I guess the Queens are the six original members of Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> you just have to look at Dolly Taylor in this, and you'll know what I mean. And uh, Eric was certainly a member of the illustrious troupe Monty Python, responsible for a television series, five films, countless records, many books. Eric recently finished his North American tour of Eric Idle Exploits Monty Python. Please welcome Dirk, Eric Idle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's enough. That's enough. We've got to get out of here. There's another thing booked. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, the museum for, for having us and honoring us. It's really a great honor. Thank you very much indeed. We appreciate it. Um, I'm really happy that it's here in my adopted hometown of Los Angeles, a place we all love, a wonderful place, the only place where the unemployed go on strike. Uh, 
there is no possessory credit on this movie. For very good reason, because it could not possibly have been done without the wonderful collaboration of the most wonderful people. I'm very thrilled and pleased that Neil Innes flew all the way here tonight to be with us. That's really great of you, Neil. It's wonderful to see you. (laughs) Ricky Fattar bicycled all the way here this evening to be with us. (laughs) Still does all his own pedaling. And... uh, Gosh. And Gary Weiss, who was the most wonderful collaborator whom I found and discovered and worked with on Saturday Night Live when we made a film about drag racing, which featured me and Dan Aykroyd in full drag running down an aer- airport <laughs> in Flushing. And without whom we could not possibly have made this uh, event, which you are now about to see, <laughs> those of you who have never seen it. Uh, so this is All You Need Is Cash, and we'll be back to answer questions and responsibility afterwards. Thank you very much. You were mentioning this is the first time you've seen this film with an audience on a yes. large screen. Yes, you are the first audience to see this film. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is extraordinary, actually, because you get, I've never heard laughs on it. It was just really amazing. <laughs> it's a surprise, isn't it, Gary? I remember nothing. <laughs> it's good to see Mick, uh, Mick Jagger. You know, in fact, I heard a story uh, about Mick just recently on the radio, about laughter and things like that, because somebody said, Mick, where did you get all these lines in your face from? And he said, laughter. And the guy said, nothing is that funny. (laughs) (laughs) Very funny. (laughs) Well, at the beginning of the film, we saw the spot where Dirk and Nasty met. And I was looking through our collection, the museum, and we have a program called Do Not Adjust Your Set. Back in the 60s, pre-Python. Is that where... Eric, you and Neil first worked together? Yeah. Could you talk about uh, those early days? Sure. Well, little I remember. We did, we, did, um, we did a children's show called Do Not Adjust Your Set with uh, Michael Palin, Terry Jones, myself, and eventually Terry Gilliam came and joined in the second season. And each week there was a musical uh, passage provided by the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. I think which... musical is stretching it. Yes. <laughs> There was a passage, <laughs> a passage, a difficult passage provided by the Bonzo Dog Band, who, whose attempts to make music with all sorts of strange, hitherto unused instruments uh, were very, very successful. And Neil was the pianist, and uh, it was I was, wonderful. yeah, but very fortunately, um, I mean, you took over once, didn't you? Because I had a very bad dose of flu. And you, you I sat in with the them band. very shortly afterwards. Uh, he was very sick, and I sat in and sang my, sang my pink half of the geranium. <laughs> What? Which I still don't understand what it means. My pink half of the drain pipe. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Geranium. (laughs) (laughs) They told me geranium. Fib fib was a bit of a... Anyway, my pink half of the drain pipe. I thought you sang Love is a Cylindrical Piano as well. Yes, I did. With the seal of good housekeeping. You were off two weeks, honey. Which is kind of guy in the (laughs) sealed (laughs) outfit. I think we should move on. Okay, we'll (laughs) say It was terrific stuff, really. And we were coming backstage when we showed the um, Lorne Michaels introduction of the Ruddles on American television that, first of all, Eric, you're playing the Stig part. You're playing George Harrison. And the music was a little bit different. Can you just talk about that original sketch? Well, yeah. I mean, um, when Eric kindly asked me to sort of join him on the Rutland Weekend thing, um, 
BBC Two, the whole idea was to do things on a cheap budget because Rutland was the smallest county in England and BBC Two loved the idea of very small budgets. <laughs> in fact, at the end of the first series, remember the fiasco, they couldn't find the key to the drinks cupboard in the hospitality suite. And I overheard one BBC executive saying to the other, and do you know the whole series has cost less than one Lulu show? <laughs> <laughs> so it was... <laughs> Lulu, well, I mean, you must know Lulu, don't you? <laughs> yes. No, no. Anyway, so, um, yeah, it, it, it sort of came about, you know, it looked like a cheap way of, you know, parodying the Beatles of doing Hard Day's Night in black and white and speeding yeah. up the film. Re uh, what used to happen is that I used to write the show and Neil would send me tapes of songs he'd like to have, you know, included and I'd try and write links that come in and out and he just sent me one which was just so beatly, it was fantastic that we had the idea to do the ruttles from it and I got the idea of the joke of running away from camera and that's, that's how that thing evolved and I had to say something so I wrote all of the thing about the ruttles, you know and then later on I went on Saturday Night Live to host it and Lorne Michaels, whom we should acknowledge as the executive producer of this, who got us all the money to make it all, um, said, you know, show that clip. And we just got all girls would write in. There was, the switchboard yeah. was flooded with responses to the Ruttles. Do you remember the, the, the thing was that at the time, somebody was offering millions of dollars to get the Beatles yeah. back together, so Lorne was offering $3,000. <laughs> You know, and, and George Harrison came on the show, and Lorne's got the money waving it, so... <laughs> All this can be yours, George, you know. <laughs> and George is saying, all of it for me? So, well, no, you have to share it with the others. But maybe you don't have to tell Ringo. That's sort of, you know. <laughs> so there's quite a build-up to it, really, yeah. wasn't there? You know, the, the and Ricky, was... how did you join? Speaking of George Harrison, oh, yeah. how did you become Well, I'm, I met Eric uh, in Barbados, and uh, he simply asked me if I wanted to be a ruttle. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I What's found myself in the middle of this madness, which is absolutely wonderful fun. We should say, I mean, I should say, because I was the last person to speak to him a few days ago, but I really do miss the fact that John Halsey, Barry Wom can't be here tonight, because um, I tried to persuade him to go, but it, he's, he's in a highly successful gig at the moment. He's got, he runs Barry Wom's pub in Cambridge. <laughs> no, it isn't called Barry Wom's pub. It's got the Castle Inn in Cambridge, and... Um, and it was just too difficult for him to get away at short notice. But he sends his love. He sends his love to everybody who remembers um, the cigarette trick and being two separate <laughs> hairdressers and all that. He's a wonderful guy. I think he's the world's funniest man, actually, Barry Wong. He really is. Yeah. Isn't, he, isn't he? He's good, isn't he? Good he's, work, he's damn good. <laughs> but the foot and mouth disease, actually, is the <laughs> answer. <laughs> The film we just saw is an amazing supergroup of the two great comic talents. Saturday Night Live meets Monty Python. Could you just talk about how the two groups I mean, merged and how uh, that came to be? Well, it, it wasn't really intended. I mean, we made it, first of all, apart from the exception of Gary and, you know, Lorne's, you know, being the executive producer. Um, we all went over to England and we had about five weeks to shoot this in, didn't we, in a, a mm. little mini budget. And then we got it back to New York. And I've, I personally felt there was something missing. I felt we were missing performances because it was all very... It was great, and we got it down, but there was no... Nobody was acting in a sort of big way, you know. And so I wrote a scene for Belushi because I felt that we needed some meat. And then we wrote something for Gilda and, and you know, Bill Murray. So, we, we, you know, we just... We sort of padded it out. We made it... We did some more shooting. And then we, we also wrote the scenes that went down to New Orleans, which was sort of added on again. You know right, I mean? yes. Um, so we, we, it was just like saying, oh, what's missing? What, how can we... Because after a bit, you know, doing a parody documentary, you get the idea, you get the gag, and no matter what you do, it's hard to keep our interest again. So that it was sort of towards the end, trying to bring in these people, these different people, and do some funny stuff. And, Gary, do you have any remembrances of production? Uh, I remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I just remember it being... It's one of those things that just, um, I mean, it sounds like a cliche to say, but it is one of those projects that you start doing and everyone got on. It's true, except for Erica in the editing room once, maybe, or something. But, no, honestly, it's, it's where everyone got on and everyone had a great time doing it and it turned out good. You know what I mean? It's just one of those deals that, that happens. And it doesn't happen very often because, I, you know, we all do stuff all the time and... Uh, that's my best memory of it, honestly. 
It was very timely, was it? I, mean, I yeah. can remember people in Liverpool, you know, That's right. playing yeah. fans, you know, they were running at, at the cars and a couple of <coughs> girls really fell over and hurt their knees and I said, hey, d you don't have to do this like this, you know, it's only a movie. He said, oh, you're all right, you know, we really know. And because every, everybody, it was a very timely time to make it, wasn't it? Mm. Everybody knew the story, because, I mean, let's face it, I mean, the Ruttles was based on an original lunch by the Beatles, wasn't it? You know? Slightly, but, yes. But then, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I remember, the only thing, the thing I remember once is when you and I, we were doing... You were dressed as, as nasty in the sort of heavily bearded days, and I was Dirk, you know, in Lexus in 1968, and George Harrison had come to visit us on the set, and we're standing there, the three of us, and people came up and went, oh, The Beatles! <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, they right. asked us for their, their, they asked us for our autographs, and they ignored George. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and speaking of the Beatles, Neil, you were the only one to appear both in Magical Mystery Tour and in Tragical History Tour. Tour. Could you talk <laughs> about the experiences of those two films? I've been starving ever since. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk? I mean, you, the Bonds has appeared in a scene of. Uh, yeah. Well. Um... <sighs> I don't. I, ca I can't exactly remember how you know we we got onto that. Except that um, Roger McGough, Liverpool poet and things like that, was in the, this group, the Scaffold, along with Paul McCartney's brother Mike, and so the Bonzos and the Scaffold used to know each other. And and Mike heard that Paul was making this movie, and I think Mike suggested to Paul, "You ought to get the Bonzos in there." And so and you know the Beatles had seen us because we'd played at I think uh, the Savile Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue we played with the Cream which was good <laughs> and we played with the Bee Gees which was weird <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah so that you know the, the Beatles knew of the Bonzo so it's, it was just one of those things that just like the Ruffles was playing <laughs> um, you know uh, it just got thrown together in a piecemeal way. And so, yes, the Bonzos turned up and did the strip club scene. We never went on the bus, <laughs> but uh, we went in the strip club, yeah. And then uh, for Rutland, George Harrison appeared on Rutland Weekend um, yes, Television. Yeah, this, this is Rutland Weekend Television. We did two series, and, but we've, we started off, I think, with a Christmas special. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked George, I leaned on him to come and be on this show, and he kept coming on and he said... I said, will you sing, will you sing, will you sing? He said, no, no, I, he, this is the sketch he did. He comes and said, no, I just, I just want to be a pirate. I want to be a pirate. I want to play, ah, ah, gym lad, ah, ah, pieces of eight. I said, no, 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 please just sing. And, and this went on and on throughout the entire show. And then at the end, mm. you saw him, and he came on in his white robe from Bangladesh, and he went, blam, blah, da, blam, blam, blah, da, 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 blam, blam, blah, blam, 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 blah, 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 blah. I want to be a pirate, <laughs> a pirate's life for me. <laughs> which, which is a great gag. I'm very proud of that gag. <laughs> and, and then uh, I just remember getting legless. We were completely legless most of that filming. Which is the English for being completely drunk and shit-faced. <laughs> um, in those days. <laughs> well, I know our... our <laughs> I know our audience has questions. This is what we're going to do. We have two microphones, so I'll pick two people out. And just wait until you get the microphone and then ask your question. Mm, okay. A lot of hands. To begin right here and right over here. You first. Wait for the microphone. Who was sitting on the microphone? <laughs> Whilst the microphone's coming, I'd just like to acknowledge John Altman, who is in the audience tonight, who did all the arrangements and all these Ruttle parody arrangements for both the first and the second Ruttles album. So, John, where are you? Please stand up. There you go. Thank you. We'll stand up for John. Yes, John. Whom I didn't recognize. Okay, we have the, the first microphone over here, and then the second one <clears throat> will be coming. Yes. Yes, sir. Whoever has the microphone, please speak. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Oh. Whoever's got the yes. microphone, this petty pilfering has got to stop. <laughs> okay. Here, okay. You can have right, we'll start over here with the Just sing a little. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Okay, I got uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is, aside from George Harrison, uh, what kind of reaction, if any, did you get from the other Beatles? And the second is, uh, is there any chance that we'll get a, a little bit of uh, Ruddles unplugged? <laughs> Ruddles unplugged. Unrugged. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> um, reaction from the other Beatles. Uh, I know Paul wasn't too impressed with your Dirk. No. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's true, I met him and he was a bit standoffish. And, um, <laughs> but Linda loved it and she kept saying it was hysterical and she adored it every minute of it. And then he found out I was from Wallasey, which is near Liverpool. He said, oh, it's okay, he's from, he's one of us. He's from Liverpool, it's okay, Linda. And somebody asked John when he was living in New York what he thought of the Ruttles and he re replied by singing Cheese and Onions. <laughs> <laughs> so I and and uh, Ringo said he liked it after 1968. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, was very, I never really understood that, but we did. When Neil and I were actually at George Harrison's house in 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 August, and Ringo and George were there, and they suddenly George picked up a guitar, and he and Ringo started to sing "Ouch," which was just. <laughs> So fabulous. But um, a very laid-back version. Very laid-back version of Ouch. And I said, well, there's two Beatles and two Ruttles. Let's form a group called the Brutals. <laughs> <laughs> right here, yes. Eric, I heard you this morning on Morning Becomes Eclectic, and you were talking about a sequel to the Ruttles. And I was wondering, are the post-Ruttles going to have a career similar to the post-Beatles, or are one of them going to have a movie studio... Etc. It's it's not it's not in that fashion. What it is is I don't know. Did anybody see the Beatles special that was on recently? Um, it's, it's called the Beatles Revolution. Well, I'm trying to make it something called the Ruttles Evolution, and it's sort of a parody of that. So we've got lots of famous people talking about the Ruttles. Um, what I did was I found I went to a warehouse in New Jersey and found all the Ruttles outtakes. And I've been using that as Lucky, a master. Lucky, really? Lucky, really. <laughs> and I've been cleverly sneaking... Neil did a second album called Archaeology, which I really loved. <clears throat> and uh, I've been carefully sneaking the music onto the old footage, which is... So sometimes we've even been lip-syncing, you know, cleverly, you just catch people. So we have a whole new soundtrack and lots of very silly people, including Tom Hanks, uh, Robin Williams, Steve Martin, Salman Rushdie... Uh, uh, all talking about how influential the Ruttles were. So it, it's not a sort of sequence of the story. It's more like a recap 23 years later, looking back now at what the Ruttles meant to our lives. And Gary didn't know about it till this evening. No, no, been... no, no, no. <laughs> but the check's in the mail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we haven't sold it, by the way, so if anybody knows any television <laughs> executives who are looking for some desperate material... Okay, we'll have a question right here and then uh, right down here. I'm kind of amazed that uh, Ruttlemania lives after all this time. I'm wondering if each of you could speak about between the time that this was made and today, have people come up to you individually and, and talked about the Ruttles, asked about the Ruttles? I mean, you know, it's not like you've been active all this time doing the Ruttles, so this is amazing. Oh, yeah, and it Ricky. happens to me a lot. I mean, I play drums with Bonnie Raitt, and I'm out, out on the road, and we just do some wonderful gig, and, you know, you come off stage, and somebody goes, I know you, you're Stig. <laughs> 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 yeah. That sort of thing. But you... Remember uh, Al Jardine came up to you? <laughs> what did he say? I can't Ricky, remember. I didn't know you were a Russell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Forgotten that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't really aware that you know that things had gone on until sometime in the mid '90s, when I was invited to go to some Beatle fests, and uh, it turned out that you know all the true Beatle fans had sort of you know picked up on the music and, and the Ruttles legend and seen it all in a, you know and is all part of the soup, as George would say, mm. and. Um, so that that was kind of new to me. So the, yes, I mean, I, I was I thought it was all over and and, and gone, you know. And um, but no, it's it's good that it's around because I don't know. Maybe time goes by and we all. Uh, so go into a <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, been uh, uh, But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe maybe we become a little bit more used to. Uh, or, or a little bit more jaded with the way things are, the way we're sort of popped at by 
you know, advertising and things like that, the way things are presented. And, and uh, the Beatles do, for a lot of people, you know, represent an era of, you know, great optimism and things like that. And so anything that puts a little smile on that kind of thing, well, maybe that's... Why? You should never analyze things, should you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. But I have had well, a long no, day. <laughs> I, I have the clip, or a couple of them on a commercial, when I do commercials in the, on the reels, and the people of the right generation, I get a lot of feedback from it, actually. People remember it and really do like it. It's, it's amazing. It's, you and know. you obviously did videos afterwards with Paul, uh, Simon. Uh, you, you right, yeah. Him, and then you did uh, George Harrison. I did with George, yeah. George should be spoken about. He was really uh, around and for this thing, by the way, in those days, when he was closer to being the Beatles. Uh, do you remember the one time in your kitchen when he was there and we were making fun of the... I don't know, we were doing some scene, and uh, I just remember him saying once that uh, he was there strumming the guitar. I forget. I remember it being in your kitchen, though, and he finally said, um, come on, you guys. I mean, you know, we were the Beatles. <laughs> and... Uh, and then he s sat for a second. He says, "Ah, oh, screw it. I, I, I don't care." But he w he was around and really, really instrumental in being positive and great about the whole thing. So yeah, yeah I, I think in in many ways, I think of it because of what what George's input was as well at the time. It was a kind of semi-official biography of the Beatles. Yeah, because remember we looked at the footage yes. that Neil yeah, has. Right. So there was, it was a, just there was damn a, depressing. There was a Beatle film which called, was called The Long and Winding Road which was never released, because none of them could ever agree what to put in or cut out. And there was an assembly of all the Beatles story, and he showed it to us, and it was wonderful. And they would never agree. They couldn't possibly put it out. So the f this film is a sort of parody of that film, which never came out. And a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of what it came out eventually in archae... Uh, anth which one is it? Anthropology, right? Anthropology. Uh, anthropology. Anthropo an what? Anthology. Anthology, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who guess, cares? It's guess, anology. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> anology. <laughs> I get so confused. A lot of that is also now revealed to be, you know, what we were parodying in the, in the first place. And I think the nicest thing that George ever said to me is he said to me once, if, if we'd known we were going to be the Beatles, we'd have tried harder. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Next questions. We have a question uh, right here. Okay, okay, sir. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Is it true that the Ruttles sold all their songs to Jermaine Jackson? And that he's been trying Actually, desperately to get, give them back ever since. Yeah. Actually, it was Jesse Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it happened around the same time as uh, Barry's wedding. There's a lot of confusion going on. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. I've I've always said that the more you know about the Beatles, the funnier this movie is. Are there were there any jokes or scenes where you just thought no one's ever gonna get this? I I, I don't know. I think my favorite scene is is Gwen Taylor. Doing um, Mrs. Mountbatten, yes, Mrs. Yes. Iris Mountbatten. Yes, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's and it's such a wonderful performance. And she also plays. Yeah. Nas she also plays Chastity. She plays. She yeah. plays both of those roles. I mean, she's Amazing. an extraordinary actress who was with she us is. on Rutland Weekend Television. I know that doesn't answer the question, but it avoids it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a, we have a question right here. Yes. Yeah, how did you get the name Ruttles? Is, is there a place in England, like you said, called Rutland, or is that where it, that's where it came from? There's okay. a place in England called Rutland, and it's the smallest county in England. It's 46 square miles, and uh, it's existed for a thousand years. And the Edward Heath Conservative government ruled it out of existence. They said we're going to have bigger counties now, and your Rutland's going to be part of Leicestershire. So we 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 just uh, this title Rutland Weekend Television was something John Cleese said to me once. And I offered him a quid for it, a pound, and he took it. This uh, <laughs> is like that. And, uh, <laughs> um, I, actually, I actually offered him a pound to shut up once, and he took it. <laughs> so, he, you know, he likes his money. 
Um, so this was like a parody TV station. I think SCTV later on did the same sort of idea, that you come from a small place and, uh, and that, that was it. So it allowed us to parody television and do all sorts of things, and this was just a parody of a documentary of, of, the, of a group, you know, that's, that's where it came from. How about a question right here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Archaeology is such a beautiful album, yet I've... It is, it's yeah. just wonderful. Yet I've, I, yeah. I haven't met anyone who's ever even heard of it, and I was wondering... <laughs> very funny. Has it gotten any attention? Well, I keep asking the record company, but they don't give me any attention. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, it's, uh, I, I think so, because um, it's around in the shops still. And I know amongst, you know, people that I work with, I'm surprised that, you know, I don't know everybody. Um, but I meet people for the first time, and they say, oh, I've got archaeology. So it's, 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 that's really nice, because, I mean, I really wanted that album to be kind of a kind of... Uh, after John the business in 1980, you know, there was... A, I really wanted to do it, um, you know, kind of my little tribute to the music. Given that, you know, people were giving me signals that they really liked the first album as well, which I was unaware of until, you know, the mid-90s. And uh, so that's how it came about. And so, yes, it has, has been out. And I'm, and I'm really pleased because my connection with the music of the, with Through the Ruttles, you know, uh, has been a labour of love, really has, because I haven't had seen a penny for it. <laughs> 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 No, but uh, but uh, yes, but I mean, uh, to to write the songs, it was a labour of love, a genuine labour of love, true admiration for the Beatles' music, and all I had to do was write Beatles', Beatles music and, and leave out the originality and inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> You're too modest. I think the, I think the, I think the music is fabulous, and I love the arc album. I listen to it every day because we're editing it into the new show. Obviously, we don't have a nice... He doesn't know that, but we have a nice new soundtrack for our show. And it's, it's really fabulous. And I think what happens is a very interesting thing in the brain. <laughs> the show. You, you, hear, you hear the original sound in your head, and then you hear which way Neil's gone with the melody. And it, it does wonderful tricks. It plays very nice. So it is literally witty music. And I think that's very unusual. And, and, and I think Mozart did it a few times. I, really, you know, I don't mean to blow smoke up your ass entirely, Neil, but uh, I, I think it's genuinely witty music as well as being very beautiful. And some of the songs are just, I think, almost as good. I mean, I, I, as good as. I could hear a lot of the music just as good as Beatles songs. Oh, you're very good. Oh, good. Oh, Ricky, do you want to talk about working on archaeology, forming the group, coming back? Uh... Um, God, Neil... I'm the quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hadn't seen this guy for 15 years, and when he turned up at Gatwick, beaming with a big box with his racing bike in it, it was lovely. And, uh, and, and of course, playing with the hard man, as we dubbed him, Barry Wong, uh, John Halsey. Because, in fact, the Ruttles have ended up as two drummers and a rhythm guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you know, but, I mean, we had lots of help on the thing, and Don Altman, again, did some more arranging on archaeology. I've worked with John for years and years. He was involved in the Innes Book of Records, and, and, and well, yeah, and, 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 and we did, you know, some of the tracks we did for Rutland as well. I mean, we've, we've really been in harness for many, 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 many years. I should also mention there's a very interesting Saturday Night Live when Eric comes back, you're doing a telethon. And Neil, you do cheese and onions in the white suit. You also do a version of Shangri-La, which you then adapt yeah. for the Ruggles. Yeah, Ruggles. exactly. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I, I mean, it took me a little while to get into my head around the idea of doing another Ruttle album. Because, you know, I mean... In 1978, when we did the first one, it was all good fun, you know, as I say, like a semi-official bi biography, but, but with you lying through your teeth. I mean, Mick could lie through his teeth, and so could uh, Paul Simon, and everybody else knew exactly what to do, didn't they? You know, um, But after, you know... Um, you know, after, after 1980, you know, I mean, where's the fun in that if you go too closely to the Beatles story? So I, I, did, I went down to see George Harrison... And I said, well, what do you think about, you know, doing some more Ruttle things? And he said, straight away, oh, which one of you is going to get shot? <laughs> and, uh, 
No, no, it's, it's, it's hard <laughs> Beatle humour, you know. Um, but I, I played him some of the songs, and, and he was sort of trying to think, um, well, oh, what's this one like? You know, because uh, the first album obviously had to be a kind of soundtrack um, signpost. You know, you know, it needed Ouch, it needed Piggy in the Middle, it needed sort of very kind of the sort of thing that attracts lawyers. <laughs> But the second album, you know, I was playing him some of the songs and he, he went, hang on, these are your songs, you know. I said, yeah, uh, like uh, Ina Klein and Middle Class of Music. And he, and he said, well, don't be shy, you know. So, it's, uh, uh, you know, George was very encouraging. Okay, we have a question right here and right here and then one way in the back. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know who did the animation for the Yellow Submarine sandwich sequence. Oh, that was my friend Tony White. Um, he did a terrific job on it, didn't he? I mean, you didn't, with no one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful in a way because we were all too busy making everything else and said, so, well, what have you got? And then, wow, <laughs> it wasn't yeah. bad at all. And, and of course, he actually, like just about everybody else connected with animation in London, had worked on the Yellow Submarine. So um, he knew all about it from the inside. And uh, so, yes, it was, I, th I thought he did an incredibly good piece of work on it. It's beautiful. Yes, back there. I had a question about the music. Um, I was wondering, were there any, ever any legal difficulties involving any of the songs? I mean, I, none of the songs were really outright parodies, but, but a few of the melodies came pretty close. And I was just I was wondering about that. Well, do you want to talk about this or do you want an intervention? <laughs> 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 yeah. It but, was claimed. Yeah, I, I can remember at the time, you know, that um, you know, the, the, the people who were then publishing Northern Songs, I think it was ATV. ATV, Lou Greed. Lou yeah. Greed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah they, they, they sort of you know, said, hang on, you know, you've, you've, you've plagiarised the Beatles. And I said, no, I haven't. And uh, yes, you have. <laughs> so this, this sort of went back and forth. And then they, they got a musicologist in and who, who answered it and um, said, you know, pointed out the melody lines were different. Um, the, the lyrics, of course, were different. And, and there's says, no case to answer, no case to go. Well, on and on it went. And halfway through, the chap was getting a bit fed up with all this. He started to have a bit of fun by suggesting... I, su I suggest that, oh, yeah... And um, all right, are in the public domain. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, and it, 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 yes, it, it, it's a funny world. It's a funny world. But they did but take it, didn't they? They, they took fifty percent of the. Yeah, of they the, wanted ninety percent. One ninety. They took, settled for fifty percent. Yeah. And I tried to cheer Neil up by saying, "Look, look on the bright side. These songs are now credited as Lennon, McCartney, Innes. <laughs> you know, yeah. how bad can it be?" <laughs> Well, they, they know as well. Yeah. <laughs> as we know, Jermaine Jackson now know. owns half of it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I have a question over here. Hi. Uh, we saw some of the great stuff that made the cut. What's some of your favorite stuff that didn't make the cut? Wow. What, I mean... I don't think anything didn't make the cut. We were on a very low budget. <laughs> yeah, no, everything yeah. that's in there. Do you remember cutting anything? Do you remember anything? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> I remember very little, actually. <laughs> no, I'm, no I'm, I don't remember. No, I'm sure. You know, there was the, the, I don't know, what were the stuff you found in the warehouse? Were the bits where oh, the, no, the, the scenes outtakes. that go on? The outtakes, outtakes is, on. Kind of, is kind of interesting. The only thing... The only thing that's, there's, there's some really nice things, which are the original performances, where we all got on stage and we filmed some songs. And there's an entire song, which I like very much, called Blue Suede Schubert, uh, <laughs> which uh, we sing and perform, which is nice. Um, anybody? Uh, I can't remember what else. There's, there's, some, there's some nice little press conference outlines and bits and pieces. There's a, there's a dreadful joke, um, which is on a sort of uh, an airline a luggage carrying thing, which you you think we're on a train or something, and it pulls out. And we're just on this luggage, which is almost as bad as a rattle joke, a beetle joke, really. Um, <laughs> it's well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know because I, there are some things Danny did that were 
you know what I mean, that maybe... Oh, there was a lot of Bill Murray, the K. Yeah, that's, that's right. what there I found. There was a lot some, of that yeah. stuff. He, yeah. he improvised probably a lot. some great stuff in there, but, yeah. you know. He was very keen, Bill Murray. He was his first season on Saturday Night Live. That's right. He was anxious to replace Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was... But he did very successfully in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question right here. Yes. Uh, you have um, <clears throat> Michael Palin uh, did a great job in it, and George Harrison as well. Were any of the other Beatles or the other Pythons asked to be involved in it prior to uh, shooting? Um, no, not actually. Um, I, not, not for any particular reason, except, you know, if everybody gets in it, then it becomes a, you know, a Python show. And it really isn't. It's a sort of, it's our, it was our show after R Rutland Weekend Television. You know, it was a melange. Um, I well, I mean, it, yeah, it, was a, it became a Saturday night. It did become a yeah. merger, hands across the water yeah. job, didn't it? Right. Yeah. With Admiral Halsey. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question back there. Yes. Oh, she doesn't need hey. a mic. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm wondering, Neil, when you start to write some of these songs, do you start with, uh, without exposing yourself to any legal problems, do you start with a, a Beatles song? Do you start with the intent of parodying something specific? No. No, no. I mean, really, I mean, I, I, but, <laughs> see, we did that thing in Rotten Weekend Television. I thought that would be it. You know, then we go and do the Saturday Night Live thing, and the next thing we know is hey, we can do the whole story. And I said, I'm watching this, you know. And so they, they look around to me and, well, can we have 20 more Ruttle songs by <laughs> Thursday lunchtime, you know? <laughs> well, well, I don't know, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah. so, I mean, I, I, well, the one, thing, one thing I did know was if I started listening to Beatles songs, I'd be screwed completely, you know, because you'd just get lost in it and you wouldn't know where to go. So I, I literally tried to think of little landmark moments in my life where I heard certain kinds of Beatles stuff with a mouth organ early stuff or then whatever and tried to think myself back into those uh, situations. The, the hardest ones were right, to write were Hold My Hand and, you know, Between Us and the, the little love songs, really, because they're more straightforward, you know, proper Tim Pan Alley pop songs. I'll get it. Let's Answer the question. <laughs> I think it's the Beatles' uh, lawyers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've just heard about archaeology. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was it, it, uh, to take your point more seriously. I mean, yes, I, I did realise, you know, that, well, that will do because that can have that kind of thing. And if anything, the Ruffles music does it really steals a lot from George Martin. If anything, the production we really listen to. Um, you can hear bongos and things on the, you know, and it made, made, made us listen to the Beatles music with sort of fresh ears, if you like, because, you know, you, you hear it on one level, but then if you start to hear it where you're analysing it, you can hear all sorts of other stuff going on. So, I mean, that's where we really sort of um, did the imitation, if you like, yeah, it was in the production. Actually, when we were mixing, that's when we listened to see how things were placed and stuff like that. We have that woman right here. Yes. <laughs> we do have a microphone. <laughs> oh. So it's all right, Hi. Bette Midler. You don't have to worry. You project. Um, the, uh, the Mick Jagger and Paul Simon uh, segments, were they improvised by them or did they have a, a script? No, they no, there was no script. I actually thought that J uh, Jagger was talking about the Ruddles as the Beatles. That's why he was so serious. And he did that whole thing about going and selling any old song and all this. I think it was, it was verbatim, wasn't it, kind of? I mean, yes, it's, pretty, it's quite interesting, because we, we did that almost before... We, it was something before we went back to England to shoot the whole show. We did these interviews yeah. in New York. So they're the first things we did. And um, I remember going to Mick, and he said, what shall I do? And I said, just play Mick Jagger. <laughs> and he said, oh, OK. And, uh, <laughs> and so it, I think that uh, I found, subsequently interviewing a lot of people about the Ruttles, is they tend to reveal more than they would if you asked them about the Beatles. <laughs> I found that particularly yeah, on the that, second one, yeah. where I've interviewed a lot more people, that they actually tell very intimate and rather sometimes very moving stories under the guise of talking about the Ruttles. And uh, Dirk isn't that popular, it turns out. <laughs> Do you know that there's a, a comedian around called Rod Hull, and he had this, this emu 
thing, which is a, a bird, you know? <laughs> and the thing was... Yes. Um, there, there is a point to this, and it isn't just jet lag, I'm sure. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> but, you see, when you've got something like that, you can do all sorts of... <laughs> you know, whatever, things that you wouldn't do normally. You see, but I did. Never mind. But... <laughs> But if you've got a character to be, to be um, pretending, you, you can pretend, you can do all this pretending thing with, uh, you know, if you've got... The point is, Neil, what? <laughs> <laughs> Mick can lie happily about the Ruttles, yeah. you know, pretending, but telling real Beatles yes. stories and real that's things right, from real life. Ruttles so in, can anybody right. else, and that's yeah. more or less what I did as, with, as, on the songwriting as well. I sort of slid into, you know, and it's good fun. Copy. In fact, I do think that ruttle ought to become a verb. Yes, N Neil actually yeah. sent me a definition of the word to ruttle, yeah, which well, I love. Which is to, to copy someone you admire, brackets, especially in the music business. <laughs> you know. <laughs> because if... Very good verb. Because if, if you think about it, um, you know, the, the Beatles themselves were, were ruttling when they sort of wanted to be uh, Gene Vincent or, um, you know, whatever. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. We'll have a question right over here, and then right back here. Um, I was just curious, was Dirk wearing the safety pins when he was knighted? <laughs> Sir Dirk, yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> anyway, like to answer, but I've got to go now. You know, time, got to get my head down. <laughs> um, George uh, calls him Sir Plus. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't make of it what you will. <laughs> yes, a question right there. Hi, uh, being a fan of the Bonzo Dog Duda band for many years before the Ruttles, and I think everybody, we have a lot of fans here. We should acknowledge you, Neil. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're a genius. We want to know, between the Bonzo Dog Band and the Ruttles, and all this time that has passed, have any of you ever had any contact with George Martin to find out what he really thought? I haven't, but you, you met George Martin in the plaza, you told me. You were with George Harrison walking up, and George Martin came down the steps and said, Hello, Eric, and started talking away, and then George said, Hey, remember me, I'm the quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> I've totally forgotten that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we no, have... I mean, I made, I made the mistake um, earlier of declaring my genius at immigration... And uh, it's, as far as I know, it's still having a body search. <laughs> okay, two more questions, and then we have a surprise. Uh, how about right back here? Uh, what? And right here. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Neil, it's a pleasure to see you again. You played the Troubadour about four oh, yeah. years ago. Great, great weekend shows. Are you going to do And we, we all missed having Eric there as well. Are you going to do any more shows in L.A.? We miss you. I'd love to. I'd love to. But it, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know, things get in the way. I mean, um, I don't know. I had to move my... Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. But, I mean, <laughs> no, it's, it's proved, you know, that, I mean, that you can sort of, on a whim, fly to L.A. for the weekend. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it wasn't a whim. It was Virgin Atlantic. You know. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, no, it, the, yes, I would, I would love to come and do some shows in America, and I'd, I'd like to work with this guy again and, um, you know, and just hang out. We don't have to be, you know, whatever, just do some... Just play some music again. That's my plan. I'm writing some new songs that aren't connected to anything for once. Um, and I, my plans are to play with a band in the UK in, for the rest of the year. And um, if I can move that around economically and... and and, and, you know, whatever. That's my plan, and I'd certainly love to come and play in L.A. again. $3,000. <laughs> so long as I don't have to share it with them. <laughs> what about uh, airfares? Yes, right uh, here. I, I love the show. I think it holds up great. I think it's hysterical. Um, I think the reporter is the funniest character in the film, and I was wondering if he'll be back to interview in the next... And also, um, you guys came up at the same time as the Beatles. Were they an impact or an influence on you guys at the time as they were coming up also? 
Well, it was impossible to live in England and not be influenced by the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I was at well. university, and we all wear tweeds and leather patches and have gowns and things, and the Beatles came by, and we were all wearing leather jackets and going, who's your favourite Beatle, you know? <laughs> I mean, they, they totally changed society. And uh, to answer your question, we will answer that in the second, yeah. the first question. Right. Any last comments about the Ruddles? Any final words? Well, I'd, 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 I'd just like to say Ollie. I'm so glad I did come. I did, I'm so glad I did come. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's wonderful to be honoured here by so many directors. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you did the uh, legend of uh, Bagger Vance? <laughs> Get out! <laughs> <laughs> I saw it on the plane. <laughs> One last question about Ollie. Yeah, that's, you know, we mentioned, you know, John Halsey not being here. John Halsey worked in a band with Ollie Halsall, and Ollie is, you know, one of the greatest, was one of the greatest musicians. Well, he still is, because it's difficult when musicians put their wonderful work down on stuff and we can hear it again and again and again, so he still is. Best guitarist that the world never really got to know. Um, he, you know, we were he a was band, amazing. weren't we? We, we? he really was amazing. In the, we, you know, we had a fortnight to make the album and a fortnight to rehearse it. And then that fortnight, we became a little band and uh, Ollie was definitely part of that. And, well, we missed him. We miss him. So, yes. Oh, dear. Lump in the throat. Yeah. Ollie Holsall's greatest. <laughs> Well, it's been a great pleasure to look at Ruddle's past, but we have a special surprise. We're going to look at Ruddle's future. So, Eric, would you like to talk, just set up the clip we're about to see, of the latest Ruddle's Well, project? this is just, uh, I mean, just say what you're saying about this character. He's now 23 years have gone by, and he's still the same asshole. So, <laughs> uh, uh, just a little older. And so we've just pulled a few little clips together to which we're editing at the moment to, sh to show you uh, what we might do with, this, with, with Ruttle's evolution. So if we crave your indulgence for five minutes, and then we can all go home. <laughs> Once again...